or may not know, but the division of the Bible as we know it into chapter and verse is a rather late development. I think it's about the 10th century. Previous to that, the scriptures were generally in, before they were in a codex or book, were on long scrolls. And uh, you would know where a passage was in relationship to another passage. Some of you may have grown up in communities where street names were almost useless. Uh, It's true in India and Bhutan and Nepal, where we just were, that you would point out where you wanted to go by the nearest nearest landmark, not the street name, because the street was almost useless. Uh, But people would know, oh, it's next to McDonald's or Dairy Queen. That's got to be, for Canadians, kind of a center of landmark. Uh, And that's how you'd identify things. Uh, Here in the Bible, what they would do is, you know, it's next to the story of the Good Samaritan. Um, And in the case of Scripture, we always read it in its context, never just the piece. You look at what comes before and after, and that's particularly true in Luke's Gospel. Context means a great deal. And in this section of Scripture, Jesus is preparing his followers for the hard facts of life. Did you ever have a conversation with your parents about the hard facts of life? And I'm not talking about sexuality. I'm talking about the challenges of living in relationship with people or being financially responsible for yourself or taking on that new job. And they want to encourage you, but they realize you've got to go and do it yourself. Jesus is preparing his disciples for what it means to follow him and the great challenges that are going to confront them in what's to come. So he knows he's going to the cross. He knows he's going to be denied in Jerusalem, put to death, and after the third day, the resurrection, And his disciples are going to have to carry the gospel to the world with the power of the Holy Spirit under very difficult conditions. And so in this component of Luke's gospel, particularly chapter 12, 13, and 14, you'll see Jesus talking about the particular challenges of being a disciple and following him. So one of the particular challenges is money, love of money. All the idols that get in the way that can distract you from being a follower of Jesus. You begin to love money more than God. Pursuit of wealth more than the pursuit of the kingdom of God. And so that, I don't think that's changed much actually. I think that's still um, a diversion for people away from the gospel. And then he talks about the particular challenge of the way they're gonna be received if they follow him. Now, I'm just coming back from countries, and I I won't name them. This is on the internet, and um, uh, believe it or not, uh, there are many places where Christians are actively persecuted and arrested. One of the, I was just in one country where Christian leaders were being arrested and put in jail for 10 days just for being Christians. You have countries with anti-blasphemy laws and anti-conversion laws. Um, And uh, that's the reality. Can you imagine coming to church on a Sunday I wonder what attendance would be like next week if you knew that on Monday you were going to get arrested and thrown in jail for 10 days, and then they decide to let you out. Would you be back in church, not the Sunday after, but the Sunday after that? Interesting. That's the reality for Christians in one of the places I recently visited. So it was very interesting, and that's done for political as well as religious reasons in that particular place. But that's the reality for many believers around the world today. It costs to follow Jesus. And Jesus was saying to his disciples, read the signs of the time. You know the signs of the weather. If a storm's coming, uh, in this church's case, it usually comes from the east. We get it coming this way with the rains. Uh, Not so long ago, I was in a place called Phuket in Thailand. In 2004, on December 26th, there was an earthquake uh, in the ocean. And it created a number of things along the coastline. The water retreated unusually. And people who were in Phuket, a number of the tourists and locals deliberately actually walked down to the waterfront, watched the water receding and actually kept going onto the beach. They were fascinated, what's going on? This is not a normal withdrawal of the tide. And they were standing there as the tsunami wave hit 15 feet, the first wave, uh, witnesses, and you can see it online if you want to see what it looks like. And thousands were killed standing there because they couldn't read the signs of the times, what was going to happen. 
Interestingly enough, many of the animals ran by instinct away from the water. And there was a tribe on one particular island that had a mythology from the last time a tsunami hit. The elders had passed on a story that said, if the water ever retreats, don't go to the water, run to the high ground. And as a result, they were spared, but thousands of others died standing there as this massive wave came in and engulfed them. Phuket, uh, 2004, December the 26th. Jesus saying to his disciples, read the signs of the times because this gospel is going to divide people. When you carry the gospel to the world, you're going to run into not just issues with the Jewish community, they'll think you're apostate, but you're going to run into the Roman world where the gospel runs so countercultural to the Roman world at the time that you are going to be persecuted just because you follow me. So what was he referring to? If you look at the um, Roman world of Jesus' time, and they controlled this area politically, uh, it was Pax Romana, uh, but they enforced it and they preserved an economic system where one third to one half of the people were slaves of uh, other people. They were property, they had no rights of their own. Now we tend to think that this was the high point of slavery. In fact, the high point of slavery is today. You realize there are more slaves around the world now with sex trafficking and other things than have been in other points in history. This is a very real issue where people are considered property and owned by other people to make profit for them. In Jesus' day, the gospel was such a threat to slavery. Can you imagine, if, read the book of Philemon, if you want to get an idea of what this would look like. Philemon has a runaway slave. And he goes to Paul, and Paul sends him back and says, receive him back as a brother in Christ, not someone you're going to brand. And that's the way they would do it. They would put a brand on your forehead to indicate you'd been a runaway slave. You receive him back as a brother in Christ. You see, when you treat people as created in the image of God, you cannot treat them as things to be disposed of, uncared for. And if we treat other people in our world as if they're created in the image of God and loved by God, it radicalizes the way we do everything from economics to politics. Can you consider a world in which the Security Council actually values everybody else around that table as equals because they're created in the image of God as opposed to people to be manipulated? You, well, you know politics. Read the newspaper. You know, how, how, how do they function, right? Uh, that's the world in which we live in, uh, real politic. But Jesus is saying Christians are to do something quite different. So this was a real threat to the Roman society. You're challenging the economic basis of slavery in Rome. Uh, it was a big threat. The second thing about Christians that was uh, a great threat was, unlike Jews who were given permission not to offer incense or sacrifice to the emperor, Many emperors took the title son of God, by the way. And so very often for Christians, it was, who do you worship, the emperor or Christ? And because we're in the Jewish tradition, one of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not bow down to what? Graven images. So the idol of the statue, Jews could not bow down. They were given permission not to do that. Jews were, uh, Christians were not considered Jews and so had no such forgiveness available. You were expected to go to the forum up the steps of the city hall of the time. There'd be a statue there and incense and you would go and make your obeisance before the son of God, the emperor. And that was considered your civic duty. And if you didn't do it, it would be equivalent to stepping all over the Canadian flag or ripping the American flag up. It would be considered anti-state. And so Christians were actually described as being uh, against the state. The other thing Christians were described as, and this is a classic, atheists. Now, remember that most of the world were polytheists. So their understanding of the gods were the gods would be placated. Humans were really the plaything of the gods. They'd come down and rape women every once in a while, and then they would play with people and for their humor and so on. But... The way you dealt with the gods was to go to the temple, make an offering, and hopefully Poseidon would not sink your ship as you were taking that cruise on the Mediterranean. 
And many of the people saw the gods in that context. They were not to be loved, they were to be feared. And so Christians come along and says, but there's one God who created you in his image and that one God loves you. Yes, we honor and fear and in awe, the, the creator of the universe, but this creator loves you and wants to be in relationship with you. It's a radically different way of seeing your relationship to the supernatural. And so for the Romans, the idea that you would worship one God seems so pathetic. They wondered if Christians had the elevator going to the top floor because surely there are all sorts of gods in the universe and you need to go and cover your bases by worshiping as many as possible. In fact, if you went to the normal Roman household or if you've gone to Pompeii and seen people's houses, you'll notice that there's one particular room that was set aside for the divinities worshiped as household gods in that place, your ancestors as well as the local gods. And then you go to the local temple to offer extra sacrifice. So the idea that there's one God who loves you and it's not your works, but the fact that Jesus dies on the cross for you just seems so odd to the Romans, particularly as Romans use crucifixion as a means of fear. They would crucify criminals on the public road to say to other people, this is what happens to you if you defy the law and the power of Rome. And so to worship a man who was crucified on a cross on the main road, most people, uh, the Greeks and the Romans are going, what are you, nuts? Um, and that was a common reaction until people met Jesus Christ and they were changed by that relationship. Now, the other thing about Christians that Romans misunderstood has to do with what we're about to celebrate in a few minutes, which is the Eucharist or the Mass. In the Mass or the Eucharist, we use the words, this is the body of Christ, this is the blood of Christ. Now, if you didn't if you weren't here on a Sunday morning and I told you those words, what might you think we were actually doing? We're carnivores or cannibals. What you need to know about the Romans is if you wanted to defame someone, you develop a genealogy for them. And in, far back in their genealogy, you'd always make sure there was a cannibal represented. If you wanted to really trash someone, their history, make sure they're related to a cannibal. So the whole idea of eating people uh, as a, a form of worship was considered absurd. Even worse, people spread rumors that Christians kidnapped babies and then ate them on Sundays. So if you're your standard Roman shopkeeper and you find out I'm a Christian, what are you thinking about me? I'm a cannibal. I may kidnap your kids to eat them on Sunday. I'm against the state. And I'm an atheist because I don't support the gods of the state, in particular the Roman emperor. So what's going to happen to me? I'm the ugliest person on the face of the world in the Roman world. And what's more, I dare to say that slave and free are equal in God's eyes, that male and female are equal in God's eyes because they're loved by God. You're challenging the economic status quo of the Roman empire. And so Christians were persecuted for all those reasons because they were followers of Jesus, even though any, many of the accusations were totally false. Marcus Aurelius, in his book on meditations, complains of Christians that they're obstinate. Even when they're tortured and put to death, they won't recant their faith. And he describes in one particular passage, these Christians are so obstinate, they won't change. And it was the martyrdom witness of the Christians in the Circus Maximus and the Colosseum when they were often put to death in very terrible ways, but some of them would be singing hymns of praise to God just like we were singing here this morning as they're about to die. And the Roman citizens watching this said, what kind of faith gives people courage to face death with this kind of love and certainty? It was an incredible witness uh, to the Roman world. Now, the other thing that's about to happen to the Jewish people that Jesus is referring to in this passage is the destruction of Jerusalem. Yes, he's going to be crucified. Yes, he's coming back from the dead. Yes, there's the resurrection, the ascension. But in 70 AD, the Romans are going to destroy Jerusalem. And the population that's transported as slaves from Jerusalem is taken to Rome and sold. Do you know what the money was used for? 
that was uh, raised from the selling of the Jewish captives from the siege of Jerusalem. They used the money to build the most famous landmark in Rome, the Colosseum. The Jewish people, their own lives, built that Colosseum that many tourists visit today. So the Colosseum represents so many things about the Roman Empire. Power, slavery, economic abuse, torture, murder. I, I can go on and on and on. Never mind the games that took place inside it, but the actual construction of it is typified by what eventually takes place in it. Until so many people in the Roman Empire become Christians that the games are ended in the Colosseum in the years to come. So Jesus is saying to his disciples, if you want to follow me, you have to make a choice. The world or the gospel? Who will you follow? I want to finish just with this particular story because I'm just coming from Calagat, uh, one of Mother Teresa's homes. It was her original home in Calcutta. And a number of the Indian mission team members are here this morning who uh, worked in different locations uh, with uh, different groups of people. Cal Calcutta probably has about 18 million people, one half of the population of Canada in one city. You can imagine what that might look like. Secondly, um, I have no idea the exact number, but I'm going to guess a million people live on the streets. They have no fixed address. They're actually on the street. You'll see it in the morning. Uh, everywhere. Um, many of the people who ended up at Caligut are brought there by the police because they find them dying on the streets. They take their name and then they bring them to Mother Teresa's institution or others like it. And we've, we saw men being carried in who had been starving on the streets, lying on a piece of cardboard probably for weeks. Lice, uh, you know, the condition just terrible, being brought in so that they can die or find healing in a place with love and respect for their last days. The other th uh, interesting thing about this place was a number of the people who found their ways there had had strokes. And was a surprise to me was that they'd actually been abandoned by their families because the family could no longer nor wish to support them because they couldn't work. And so they were put on the street. And so they found themselves there. So this whole place is filled with people who feel unloved, unwanted. And the ministry of Caligut is to say, there is a place where you are wanted and you are loved. It's not perfect, but you're wanted and you're loved here. And it's the small acts of love. And as I was thinking about this, as I was washing 300 people's clothing each morning by hand, there are no washing machines, there are three big tubs transferring and you squeeze them out and so on, uh, filled with lice. And then uh, you wash people's dishes and you help people with meals. But one of the things I ended up doing was playing games with a number of uh, the guys sitting around the table who, did, who had had strokes and uh, trying to make them laugh or doing a, a coloring with them on the one hand they could use. It was the whole idea of feeling valued and loved. Now, when Mother Teresa started Caligut, she came from an order in which she was teaching some of the elite women, girls of Cal Calcutta. And the order saw that their future would be of great influence with young women who were going to take positions of influence in Calcutta in the years to come. When she went to the order and said, I'm feeling God is calling me to go and care for the poorest and the people who are dying, the initial reaction was, are you sure about that? These people have no future. It's literally a dead end. Why would you work with this group? There's so much poverty here. You're actually gonna have more of an influence if you work with the young women who are gonna have positions of influence in the society in the future. But she was persistent and had a tremendous sense that God was calling her to follow the gospel in a very different direction. And so eventually they relented and let her do the work and then she founded the Order of Missionaries of Charity and it spread all around the world, including one location here in Toronto. For me, the really interesting example was choosing to follow God and watching the blessing that comes from it, even though it looks like it's taking you in a very different direction. And Jesus is saying to his disciples and to us, to follow me will cost you. 
But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all the rest, all the rest of the things you're really looking for, peace, hope, love, joy, will be added unto you as you are faithful to the gospel. Amen.